we're talking about molecular phylogeny. Okay, so we're just doing one single dot point here, uh, but it's analyzing data from molecular sequences to infer, and that's the main point there, infer species evolutionary relatedness. All right, so we've used physical features, um, physical traits to build visual representations of evolutionary pathways, but we know this isn't the only way we can classify organisms and therefore organize them, right? So we can achieve a very specific outcome using molecular data. So instead of simple character traits, the evolutionary relatedness uh, or relationships are determined using DNA, RNA, or protein sequences which are similar or different to other species. So firstly, we need to recap the purpose of DNA. Okay, and DNA is made up of a sequence of nucleotide bases and this long double-stranded, uh, sorry, this long double-stranded macromolecule is wound really tightly to form chromosomes in the cell's nucleus. Now, the long DNA strand is more has more specific regions called genes, where the sequences of the nucleotides is a set of instructions for building proteins. Right. So the DNA in the nucleus is used to create a very long string of polypeptide and therefore the, the protein okay and more of this process of um, protein synthesis it's going to be covered in unit four so once that um, amino acid sequence is built that long chain of polypeptide that polypeptide can be folded around and around right and so the genes in the dna are able to evolve and change in the same way that the physical features of an organism can adapt to their environment in fact they really go hand in hand if a protein is really well suited to performing its function and leads to some kind of advantageous trait in an organism, the DNA sequence which codes for that production of the protein will remain conserved over time. Okay, so for example, some sections of the amino acid chains within the hemoglobin protein, which is shown here. Now, because the DNA sequence in the genes is conserved, they continue to pass down into you know, every subsequent generation. So in turn, species which are distantly related will share a DNA sequence in a particular gene. So tiny changes can accumulate over time if the nucleotides change within the gene, but the general function of the protein will remain the same. So if you're looking, so this picture is showing a particular gene in different species, and all the green and blue areas are shared between all of those different species. Now, an example of this is the histone protein 1. Now, its role is to basically be the spool which DNA winds around in order to pack down really tightly to fit into the nucleus of cells. Now, if mutations occur in the histone gene, the protein um, that is produced can't function properly. So the DNA might wind around that protein too loosely, uh, too tightly, or not at all, which is not advantageous. Okay, That means that the DNA can't pack down into the nucleus. So it's unlikely that that trait is compatible with life, and the mutated version of the gene will not be passed down onto any kind of um, new generation. So the original gene for the functioning histone protein will be really conserved, right? It's highly conserved and it will be continually passed on to new generations. Because of this, most eukaryotes have almost the same H1 gene, right? That histone protein gene. So humans and chimps actually have an identical amino acid sequence in this gene or in this protein, sorry. And it's through comparing the same gene in different species. Um, in this way, we can infer the evolutionary relationships between the organisms. Now, genetic mutation does occur and that's where the nucleotides can be you know removed inserted swapped whatever it needs to be and this can occur naturally at a regular rate so even without any sort of outside influences uh you're talking radiation you know light exposure uh chemical exposure that can actually increase the rate of the mutations occurring. But even if there is no uh, influential factor like that, it will still occur naturally. Now, if mutations occur in a functioning gene, it will change the protein which is produced, and that's going to be passed on to the next generation and become more or less common depending on what it is, right? If a mutation occurs in a, say, non-coding region, then it's not going to produce a protein. So sometimes those mutations go unnoticed. Right? It's not going to impact any protein, and so it's called a neutral mutation. So even if there is a mutation in a gene, we can have a protein that doesn't quite work, but in those neutral mutations in a non-coding gene, there is going to be very little impact or no impact, really, because it's not for making a protein. These are neutral mutations. Right, The frequency at which these neutral mutations occur is actually quite consistent. 
Okay, in humans they occur at a rate of 10 to the negative 8 per nucleotide uh, site per generation. So, you know, that's a remarkably small number, but considering the huge numbers of generations which have existed since our last common ancestor with any other species, that's, you know, can still be a lot. So because we know that these mutations, uh, so we know how and, and how often these mutations um, occur, we can use it to date back to when we diverged from our most recent ancestor. So it's like a molecular clock. Now, because we can sequence DNA with relative ease these days, the world of bioinformatics is used to compare and align these gene sequences within different species. And this information can be used to cre create phylogenetic trees where we can create extremely informed best guesses about our evolutionary pathways. Now, we can compare a single or a set of genes and we can be really specific with the information that we collect and date and use to infer the relationships between organisms. And interestingly, we can use this to map the genome for diseases and, say, viruses now as well um, as they evolve like COVID-19. And you can see this is a bit of a, um, a phylogeny chart there for COVID-19. And there's one here that's talking about all the different uh, species where it has actually popped up in. So importantly, this is about analyzing data to infer species evolutionary relatedness, but it's all about the molecular sequences. Okay.